4, beginning at verse 31, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 31. And as Dan just mentioned, um, Paul gives us a vocabulary list of things of what kindness is not. And uh, that's where we start Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 31. The Apostle Paul writes, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I'd like to begin our study of kindness this morning by making this statement. We can see the next slide. The church is an alternate, refreshing society. Uh, this idea is, is given, as I mentioned last week, by uh, Tullian Chavidian in his book, Unfashionable. And really what the world recognizes is that what the world has to offer is ultimately not satisfying. Though the world has wealth and power and social connections and, and all kinds of, of seemingly good things, ultimately what the world has doesn't satisfy. And so when people come to a church, really what they're saying is, I need to find something different than what the world has. I need something that is refreshing, something that's, that's different from the world simply saying, well, if you have all this stuff, you'll be happy and you'll be whole. And so what the church says is it's not about material wealth. What the church says, it's not about titles. What the church says, it's not about how much you can gather for yourself, but instead what the church says is it's a call to a different life. It's a call to a life of discipleship. It's a call to a life of following Jesus Christ as our Savior. And one of the strongest ways that we can see that we're unusual to the world is next, that Christians see a different picture of success. In Acts 17, the early apostles were accused of, of turning the world upside down. And, and, and when leaders of the Roman world saw what was going on in the church, they said, you're turning the world upside down. Right? The, the world is supposed to be about political power. The world is supposed to be about might makes right. But, but what you're doing is telling them something different. You're turning the world on its head. Or what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. In God's book, what's foolishness to the world is wisdom for us. In God's book, what's weakness to the world is strength for us. Because in God's book, as Christians, we're not called to a life of power or a life of worldly success, but we're called to a life of, of laying aside our power, a life of following Christ who set down his power and made himself nothing for us. Or you think about 2 Corinthians 12. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Right? What a powerful picture of, of an alternate view of success. Right? That, that my own personal strength, my own personal power, my own personal worldly wealth is not something that, that I need in order to survive, but instead everything I need comes from God himself. And, and actually when I am weakest, then I see without a doubt that God is strong. 
to new economics. The world says that strength comes from being first, but the gospel tells us that strength comes from being second. The world says that you need to fight to get to the top. The gospel says that the first shall be last. The world says that you should live for your greatest pleasure and your own personal happiness. But the gospel says the greatest thing to live for is God's glory and your personal holiness. Right? It's not about us. It's about God and it's about following him closely with everything we've got. And this ties in intimately with kindness, the fruit of the Spirit that we find is completely unfashionable to the world around us. You know the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We've been studying the fruit, and this week we're studying kindness. And abbreviated definition from Tim Keller says this, that kindness is serving practically with vulnerability. I like that definition. I wouldn't put it on the screen if I didn't, right? Um, it gets at the fact that, that kindness and love are not the same thing. So often we want to say, well, kindness and love are kind of interchangeable. As I think about kindness, and as I studied kindness this week, it seems like kindness is a subset of love. Right? The big picture of love can be seen as far as intimacy with a spouse. It can be seen as showing forgiveness. It can be seen as, as showing patience. Right? There's, there's all kinds of ways that love manifests itself. And kindness is really a subset of love. This definition says serving. That means that we help others. Tim Keller used an illustration that helped me understand this. He said that when you own a home, you recognize the inherent value of your home. In fact, if you're like me, if, if you own a home or if you're, yeah, the bank owns most of my home, but the little bit of, the, of my home that I own, uh, I, I really love it and I want to care for it, right? Because it is the most valuable asset that I have. And so, uh, you know, we had these horrible storms the last couple days, and, and if I found that there was a, a leak in my roof, and, and I was told by a contractor it'll be $2,000 to fix that, to make it so it doesn't, you know, damage the beams in, in your attic, and so it doesn't damage any more in your house, if I found that out, I would say, $2,000, yeah, that's worth it. Right? You know, my, my house is, is valuable enough to me and, and, and really has value for my family that I would say, of course, I will give that $2,000 to get that fixed. But it's not so if, if my TV went out today. If I was told it's going to cost $2,000 to fix your TV, I would say, TV's not worth $2,000, right? I, I don't want to get it fixed for $2,000. I can get one for a lot less expensive than that. I'll just, I'll just replace it. It's not worth doing anything about it. When we're given the opportunity to serve, when we're given the opportunity to show kindness, when we see a need in front of us, whether it's inside or outside the church, whether it's inside or outside our family, whether it's with people who are like us or different from us, that same question is presented to us. Are they worth it? Is it worth investing in this person? And as Christians, the answer is always yes. We've been saying it throughout this service and talking about right to life and talking about the value of the unborn and talking about people who've gone through horrible physical violence, people who are running for their lives literally. Is it worth Serving them? And the answer is yes. Yes, these people have infinite value, way more value than a house could ever have, way more value than anything else on earth could ever have. These are people made in the image of God. And for us to say, I don't know if it's worth it. No, of course it's worth it. Right? This is the, the crown of creation, the pinnacle of, of God's created world. These are people who God values, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight, and they're also precious in mine. And we serve them practically, according to this definition. Here's a spoof a few months back. You may have seen on a, a Christian aid group that was selling the idea of buy one blender, give one blender to, to an African village. 
And, and uh, the reason why it was <laughs> such a great spoof is because you see these people, and, and granted these are all actors, and, and it's really just poking fun of, of how we sometimes don't serve practically, but it was poking fun of the fact that, that these people, if they were given a blender, they don't have any electricity, right? They don't have anywhere to plug it in, and they don't have any frozen fruit or ice cubes to make a smoothie. And, and so, you know, these, these innovators, oh, look at how great we are for serving these people. They, they're going to have the best blender that, that's known to man. And, and, and the, the whole joke was, well, as Christians, we have to look and see, you know, am I doing something that is practically helpful for them? And this was one of those cases where there's practically and literally practically worthless for them. So the deacons and all of us have to ask the question, when we serve someone, how are we helping them in the long run? Are we helping them or hurting them? Are we creating authority in a sense of, of worth in a person's life or are we creating dependence? Are we empowering people or enabling people? Is this practical service? And finally, it's serving practically with vulnerability. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Vulnerability means that you serve by carrying another's burdens. Other, other translations say, bear one another's burdens. And the idea here is, is that if you see someone who is, is bearing the weight of the world, that even has 100 pounds of weight in a backpack on them, you know, sort of uh, figuratively speaking, you see that they're, they're weighed down by these burdens, and you say, you know, if you only take a pound out of their backpack, you're not really bearing their burdens for them. But if you take 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds and you say, you know what, I'm going to suffer with you. I'm going to take on this burden myself. And it might mean that I sacrifice some of the leisure that I might have otherwise. I sacrifice some of the, the time that I have otherwise. It means that I sacrifice my own wellness or happiness or wealth. It means that we give sacrificially. We become vulnerable to help those in need. This is what kindness is about. And this isn't just a matter of charity. So often we think about kindness and say, oh, we, we need to help people who are really in need. But really what this is about is a desire that people would flourish. That they would do what God has created them to do. To be able to say, I want to do everything I can to help people. Show that they're made in the image of God. To help people. To do well in their lives. And I want to celebrate when they do. The idea of rejoicing with those who rejoice. It means celebrating wholeheartedly. When you hear someone who's expecting a child, even though your family or your children's family has been struggling with that for years, to say, boy, I'm really glad that God has gifted this new life for you. It means rejoicing deep down inside for a friend who's getting happily married even though for years you've asked God to bring that special someone into your life. It means real happiness at friends, opportunities to spend time with the whole family all together, even though you don't have that opportunity anymore. Kindness. With that definition, what do we find about kindness from our text? Look with me again at verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. We're told next that kindness, it replaces a number of vices. That's what our text tells us this morning. Get rid of all these evil things. Instead, be kind. And as Dan mentioned, when you say, okay, bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice, okay, those are all good things to get rid of. But then you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Get rid of anger? Really? We can't be angry? If you look back, and it should be on the screen, Ephesians 4.26 Paul wrote this just a few verses earlier. In your anger, do not sin. 
So Paul says, be angry, but don't sin. And then five verses later, don't be angry at all. Which is it, Paul? You think about Jesus' life. And you think about the way that he, he called out Pharisees and scribes. He called them hypocrites. He called them snakes. He said that they were abusing the people of God. You remember that my Savior Jesus had a cord of, uh, that he turned into a whip. That he whipped those who were in the temple and overturned their tables and said, you've turned the house of God, a house of prayer, to a place where money is exchanged. Was Jesus kind there? Or was Jesus angry? I think Jesus was angry. I think Jesus showed us a picture of, of righteous indignation, of being able to say, there's such horrible injustice in this world that I can't help but have my heart go out for these people. Right? The sense of, of holy anger, of knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is what God is grieved about as well, and so this is what I'm grieved about too. I'm angry when I watch those Planned Parenthood videos. I'm angry when I see that kind of stuff that's happening in our world today, just like Jesus was. And I think, though, when Paul lumps anger here together with all these vices, he's talking about something different. And I think what he's talking about is, is unchecked anger, right? And, and anger that's completely out of control because you look at the rest of the list and Paul has to be describing something different here. Anger is lumped together with bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness. Bitterness leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. Bitterness brings down the mood of others because of your past pain. See, bitterness is not a picture of kindness, but instead it brings down those around you because of your past pain. Rage is a picture of unbridled anger that damages things around it. Brawling is anger to the extent that it causes physical conflict in the form of fighting with others. Slander is intentional harm to the reputation and good name of others by spreading gossip and lies. Malice is a desire to inflict harm on someone because of deep-seated resentment to them. Right? All of these things talk about destroying the good of another, whether it's physically whether it's with our words, whether it's with our intentions, all of these are meant to destroy the good of another. Paul says, get rid of all these things. Those things are associated with the flesh. Those things are associated with sinfulness, with the old self. Instead, verse 32, be kind. And this is one of those really simple, biblical, either-or situations. You can either live a life of destructive evil or constructive kindness. You can either live a life, says Christ, for me or against me. John says you can either live in the light or in the darkness. Repeatedly, we're told over and over in Paul's letters, you can either live the new life, a new holy life in Jesus Christ, or the old life that's sinful. It's either or. And I know that for all of us on a daily basis, we, you know, we might sway between the two and we might look a little bit like our old self or a little bit like our new self, but what Paul is challenging us here is a commitment to the new self, a commitment to kindness, a commitment to putting to death that old dead self that was found in our sinfulness. And it's here that we see it's not something that's just skin deep, but instead it's a matter of character and of our hearts. It's a matter of character and of our hearts. That's what verse 32 tells us. Next slide. Our translation says, be kind and compassionate to one another. What many other translations say is, be kind and tender-hearted to one another. It gets at Christ's work in the world. Right? He not only gave the good news of the gospel to the people, but he also fed the hungry. He gave the ability to walk to the lame. He gave sight to the blind. He gave water to the thirsty. He raised dead Lazarus to life. Right? He cared about the stuff of this world. Christ didn't just come on a spiritual mission to reclaim people's souls, but he came with not only good word, but also good deeds. 
It calls for us to have that deep inside of us, to care for those around us because it reaches down to our hearts, that we are tender-hearted and compassionate, not just skin deep, but instead something that reaches to the very core of who we are. Matthew 25, there's this picture of end-time judgment where, where Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats and, and he tells the people, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. And, and those who are on his right say, well, Jesus, we never did any of that for you. And Jesus tells them, whatever you did for the least of these, Matthew 25, verse 40, you did for me. And we might look at that and say, but pastor, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. Is Jesus here saying that we're going to be judged based on what we do? Well, I don't think what Jesus is saying here conflicts with the fact that we're saved by faith. But what Jesus is telling us here is that it doesn't stop at faith. Right? We're given the evidence of following Jesus that we begin to treat others as if it's Jesus himself that we're serving. That we show that kindness to those who are hungry or to those who are in jail or to those who are naked, to those who have nothing and treat people with the same dignity as if it were Christ himself we were serving. How do we do that? Next, how we look to God's kindness to you really starts at the end of verse 32 and goes through verse 2. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Brothers and sisters, this is the scandal of the gospel. Every other world religion, it's completely foreign for them to show any picture of grace, to show any picture of mercy. Right? The, the gods are people that are, are only concerned with justice, are only concerned with, well, if you do good, then you get good, or if you do evil, then you get evil. Our God is different from any other God of any other religion. And he's not only get different in that he gives us grace, but he's also different in that he shows us kindness. Serving practically with vulnerability. What better person has ever done that in the history of the world than our Savior Jesus Christ? And what a God in all the pantheon of religions in the world knows of a God who becomes vulnerable. Gods are supposed to be distant. Gods are supposed to be powerful. Gods are supposed to be on thrones and in clouds and atop mountains and unreachable. And yet Jesus Christ came down and dwelt among us. He became so vulnerable that he was willing and he did give his own life. And not in a way that was, that was heroic or in a way that, that made people say, oh, wow, what a great way to go. But instead, he went to the cross for you and for me. And he served us in the most practical way than anyone ever could. Practically speaking, we could never make ourselves right with God. There was too much sin between us and him that we could never have a right relationship restored with him. And yet Jesus Christ says the only way for them to be made right is for me to practically serve with vulnerability. This is almost so good that it is unbelievable. And yet, brothers and sisters, I'm asking you today to believe it. Because the word says that if you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And this is a call for all of us, young or old, first time or many times here, to, to renew our relationship with Christ, to renew our trust in him. This is good news today. Maybe you've heard the story of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was a man in Britain who was moved by the grace of God in his life. He came to Christianity about 200 years ago. He was moved by the kindness of God, the willingness of God to, to serve practically, to become vulnerable for him, that he said, I need to show kindness to others. 
Wilberforce saw the inherent value of human life. He said, people are worth it. And he saw even people who were slaves at the time were worth it. It grieved him. It moved his heart to say, how could people made in God's image be treated as property? How could people in God's image be treated so horribly? And so he said, I have to do something. So he and a group of others became politicians and they, they became members of parliament. Then they swayed parliament to abolish slavery, to say this can't go on anymore. It was a huge act of kindness for people who weren't seen as being made in the image of God. But he also recognized something in a very wise way, something that I hadn't heard about until this week when I was studying William Wilberforce. He recognized that the kindness shown to these slaves could cause exactly what Paul wanted the people to put off in this passage. It could cause the owners of the slaves to be bitter, could cause the owners of the slaves to be full of anger and rage, could cause them to slander and have their hearts be full of malice. And so William Wilberforce did something in the 1833 abolishment of slavery in Britain. They included in that act not only that all slaves would be free, but they also said will use government dollars to pay the price for their life to the slave owners. We will pay to set them free. And so at that time, about 20 million sterling pounds were set aside in 1833 in order to pay for these slaves to be set free. In today's dollars, or in today's pounds, it's about 70 billion billion, with a B, British pounds, that cost to set the slaves free. In today's dollars, it's just a hair under 109 billion U.S. dollars. What an act of kindness. Not only for those who were set free, but also for those who might be tempted to put on the flesh, to say they're worth it practically serving to the point of vulnerability. When we see the kindness of Christ in our lives, it moves us to being kind. Not because we feel obligated, but instead because we feel motivated, right? Look at the kindness of Christ in me. Look at the forgiveness that God has given me. Look at the fragrant offering that Christ is for me. How could I not be that for those around me? On the one hand, you say it's, it's completely natural if you fully get what Christ has done for you. But on the other hand, you say that's got to be a completely supernatural thing. That has to be something for the Holy Spirit to move in you and move in that way. And that's what this series is about, right? It's about the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit, the natural outworking of the supernatural Holy Spirit working in you. And maybe you this morning have someone in your heart Maybe you this morning have a cause on your heart, whether it's for the unborn or for those who are further along in life, who have the cards stacked against them. Maybe it's someone today that you're thinking of that you say, I could give my life to because I want to see them flourish and I'm willing to give myself. The call for you today, brothers and sisters, is to be in step with the Spirit, to not get in way of the Spirit, to not squelch the Spirit of God. Look back with me at verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How do we show the kindness of God today, finally? By not grieving the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you today, listen to the Spirit's voice today. Look to the cross of Christ today. Brothers and sisters, be kind to one another today. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the nearly unbelievable and incredible kindness that you've shown to us in Christ Jesus. God, thanks that he gave himself for us Thanks that he served us in a way that no other person ever had or ever could or ever will serve us. 
God, help us to be moved by that grace and kindness to serve practically and vulnerably with those around us. God, help us not to merely retreat to safety, but instead help us to see that because you are good to us, we are called to be good to those around us. God, thank you for this good news today. Help us to rejoice and live into this new life you've called us to. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. God is loving.